Welcome back to Golden Rule Radio. First thing I'll mention this week is to go to last week's show and check that out. That was a really good one, I thought, with Rob talking about platinum, talking about some of the opportunities in the precious metals market. So go back to last week's show on Golden Rule Radio. Listen to that one if you didn't already. This week, we're going to talk about some key support and resistance levels here. Let's start with gold. Thanks, Robert. So following that drop we had in the gold price, I know for the last month or so we keep singing the same song, right? We see sideways to downward pressure on the metals, likely upwards pressure on the equities market. In fact, two big news pieces briefly. The transports broke into a new all-time high, which, as we say, is potentially leading the charge there for the equities and doing that on the heels of Chairman Powell coming back out with his hat in hand, asking for a few extra dollars. I think the exact words were, now's not a time to be worried about inflation or debt. I think he said debt. So with that being said, a lot of free money going around pushing the equities market up leading into the elections. And with that, we see gold doing exactly what we expected to see going into those elections. So we had that breakdown back in the middle of September, broke through that short term floor, came down to the short term 618 fib which was lined up right with the long-term 382 FIB. Uh, We had this long-term chart a couple weeks ago back on the show around 1850. We've bounced back up, as we always say, floors become ceilings, ceilings become floors. So we came back up to around 1920, where the previous floor was, and we've come back down from there. So the question is, do we see some upwards momentum continue in the short term? But I still think, arguably, we're looking sideways to down in gold price. Yeah, I'd agree. I think the chart you're showing there with the support becoming resistance is a very beautiful example of how that's happened in the chart with gold. The support line there, obviously, a few times, and then as we've pushed back up, clearly became resistance. Love that chart, too. I was glad to see you throw it up there last week, and you guys did a great job with Rob because it's one thing to talk about the support and resistance levels in the gold. It's another to talk about where does it break out, upside, downside. And I hear you saying that you see continued indications of some weakness. I said in my quarterly letter to my clients, I expect also this sideways movement between that really 1850 to 1920, and you feel like we're going to go below that before we go above the 1920? You think you see below 1850 first? Yeah. Now, obviously, we're speculating on that point. Uh, It's easy to see where the rungs on the ladder are. It's a little harder to know whether you're climbing up or going down. If we were to push below that 1850, and my gut says, you know, since you're asking me to speculate, sure, I do. I do think we're going to at least retest that bottom, if not push below it. And if we push below it, we actually have a ways to go. The next major, major support level is going to be your long-term 50% line, which again, for people who listen to the show every week, I know you're getting sick of hearing this, but a 50% correction is still very bullish. So don't think gold long-term is turning down by any means quite yet. There's been no signal of that. If anything, this is the healthy type of retracement you need in a market, which means that we do have higher prices to go to. Generally, if a market only goes one direction for an extended period of time, when it runs out of steam, it's done. You want these corrective periods in between a long-term running bull market and coming on the heels of someone like Powell continually saying, I need some more, please. There's no reason to expect to see anything but all markets, including the equities market, climbing because it's just becoming cheaper and cheaper to buy stock. And we're going to see that here in a minute when we look at the dollar chart. So by the 50% retracement, you mean around the 1775 figure? Sure. 1775 would be a very healthy correction. And that's only 50%. We could go all the way to the 618 fib. Yeah. To see that, it's going to take news, right? It's going to take something underlying in the markets that's going to push it there sooner. Someday we probably see it. It's a matter of when. I tend to lean a little bit more towards the bullish side just because I don't see a COVID vaccine coming out between now and the election. I see the election being the next major piece of news, either something tied directly to the election or the election itself, because now we've had the stimulus. You talk about the free money going everywhere. Where it's not going uh, is out to the general public in the form of another COVID you know, the HEROES Act or a Stimulus Act, which is what Powell's been calling for. Now's not the time to worry about debt. He wants there to be an injection of capital into the markets, stimulating the economy. And 
I don't see that happening. It doesn't sound like from the White House administration that that's going to happen between now and then. So I'd be anxious to see what actually does play out that drives the market down a little further. And it's going to have to coincide with a dollar rally, don't you think, Robert? Yeah, I think it would correspond with the dollar rallying, you know, pushing pressure on the metals to the downside. The dollar's had a nice rally, like what we talked about, and it came up into the 95 range, almost to 95. There was some congestion in that range as it had dropped in late July. So it's pushed back into that congestion and now kind of slid back down. The dollar has a trend line support that has kind of just here in the last few days been violated, violated the trend line to the downside. So is that a key sign that the dollar has finished its upward movement? We will quickly find out here in the next month or so. But if the dollar were to push a little higher into the 95, 96 range, then that would, I think, coincide with that 50% line on gold that Miles was talking about. Right. And I think there's even more evidence that this may be the case, because when you look at some of the other metals, like, say, silver, silver's already broken below that long-term 382, whereas gold has just come into it. Silver wasn't able to put in a higher high and then put in a lower low here just over the last couple of weeks. So silver definitely looks like it could be rolling down to the downside. Now, it's long-term 50% line is going to put you just above 20, and his long-term 618 would be sub-19. So that tells you as big of a drop as that may feel, that tells you that's only less than two-thirds of what the rise was, that 618 FIB correction. So a drop all the way back down to 19 is equally still bullish, even though we're coming off 29 That just tells you how far ago it was that we started. So I definitely long term still continue to see really aggressive bullish movement, both from a geopolitical, political, domestic, economic, financial, all these fundamental reasons why you should expect to see gold continue to climb. But I'm seeing some opportunities pending in the charts. Now, does that mean I'd be holding off on gold purchasing today? Probably not. I may, if I had X dollars to put into the market, I would definitely be dollar costing in when we hit these levels. 382 FIB's a great place to enter a portion of your assets. The 50% line is another good one, and if we came all the way to the 618, you better back the truck up. So there's no reason to try to ring the bell and get that perfect timing in your long-term investment assets. But gold, silver, declining, showing signs of continued weakness in the short term, the dollar showing some continued strength in the short term. But when we keep hearing Powell say the same thing, and we know they're just writing all those blank checks, you know what the long term is going to look like anyway. Yeah, it's still inflate or die. I mean, it really is. Powell also said that he sees global deflationary pressures. That is every central bank's nightmare. As long as deflation is causing them the greatest concern, they're going to continue to inflate. That's why he says now's not the time to worry about the debt. So inflate or die is still intact. Uh, Negative interest rates are not what they're looking to use. And the result of that negative interest rate policy, he says, are mixed. And that's not just here in the United States. That's after trying it for eight years in the Eurozone. So as long as you have a negative real rate of return, you should be buying gold. And there's no telltale signs on the far horizon as to when real rate of returns turn positive. So just continue to be buying gold and be buying every dip you get as you get into these support levels, whether it be that 1850 or whether it be 1775. So we covered silver, covered gold. You guys want to talk about platinum? Yeah, last week's show. Yeah, let's carry off over that and palladium up and platinum down this week. Even better. Right. I mean, when you're talking about those ratios and some of the ratio charts we put up last week, anytime you see that spread back out, especially coming off the numbers it just did, since nothing ever goes one direction, right? You always have little slight reversals in the middle of a trend. So we're seeing a nice reversal in that ratio trade. Platinum had a real pretty aggressive climb there following the March drops. We're talking about like a 550 to over a $1,000 rise. Platinum took a 100% rise in a couple months. It's not unreasonable to see it turn around and come down. So Platinum's still, even though after all of this, only at its 382 FIB. So Platinum still has a ways to go. But like silver, it broke that number. So silver, Platinum being more volatile than gold have made more volatile moves down and seem to be leading the charge on the downside. Palladium, on the other hand, 
still hard stuck in its rising wedge and back up near the top of it. So palladium seems to be day-to-day trading a little bit closer to what, say, some other industrial commodities might be, whereas platinum seems to be trading more like what, let's call them, the currency commodities are, like gold and silver. So we're definitely seeing that disconnect from platinum and palladium, even though you almost can't find two periodic table elements that are more closely linked. They seem to be, as far as the markets are concerned, completely in different directions. You know, speaking of the platinum and the silver, the white metals in general, I mean, palladium's been sort of this anomaly for a while now, but platinum and silver, you should expect to have their best run when the economy really starts to take a run. And that's what we're not seeing. And that's one of the reasons that I don't feel like we're going to break out of this sideways channel between now and the election. You're getting the last of the quarter economic numbers rolling in, some of the meaningful ones like employment for September and what have you. Some of the quarterly ones, I take that back, are still going to roll in and it's just not going to be pretty. Uh, But that being said, unemployment is at 7.9%, which is the same level as when President Obama won re-election. So economically, you can say that you've got these new highs in some of the equity indices. And then you have the fact that between now and the election, there's just not going to be big numbers rolling in. And our marketing director brings up the point that he sees web traffic waning in terms of investments, just like they did this same period of time in 2016. So you sort of peter out towards the election in that final month, and then you have this opportunity to see how things respond initially in the days following the election. Yeah, I think that's a behavioral choice that a lot of people are making, and it's showing up in the markets. I have some personal experience with a group that has decided to postpone making a large financial decision until right after the election, not even to talk about it. You know, let's not even talk about it. Let's set the meeting for Wednesday after the election. Not that we're going to actually maybe have a final (laughs) winner, but (laughs) at least that behavior, we're seeing it show up in the markets. So, you know, on the flip side of that is wait until the behavior changes because we saw the behavior clearly change when COVID happened. You see silver and gold start rising. You see premiums go way up on physical deliverable silver. And so it's just a matter of time. That pendulum is going to swing back the other way. The behavior is going to change. You're going to be scrambling to buy metals. Robert, great points. And I could elaborate for many more minutes on that. And we will in the coming weeks because we're going to need some stuff to talk about here too, just in terms of what those bullish factors and bearish factors are going into the election. So tune in the coming weeks and we'll tell you what an election outcome could do in terms of the impact on the precious metals prices. And again, that's just conjecture on our part and uh, whether or not you should be selling or buying or holding at this point. So that's it for this week with Golden Rule Radio. Thanks for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, you can hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, and join us in the comments if you have any questions or anything you want us to take a look at. You can also head over to our website, McElvaney.com. You can find us on Twitter at ICA Gold or Facebook, McElvaney Financial. And as always, if you want to chat with one of us or any of the other advisors here at McElvaney ICA about your personal precious metals portfolio, you can give us a call at 1-800-525-9556. Thanks for listening. Have a great week.